of the Lord God himself. Pray for you daily that the Lord God himself will show himself strong in your lives at all times. Praise God. <clears throat> How many of you were on the live yesterday? All right. Let me know on the chat. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. How many of you thought it was outlandish? <laughs> How many thought it was outlandish? How many thought it was different? How many thought it was truth? Praise God. Praise God. I see someone said different. <laughs> Hallelujah. Truth be told, if you don't tell people why you say don't do something, that's the very thing they're going to go and do. That's the fallen nature. The moment I tell you, don't think about bread. What did you just do? <laughs> you just thought about bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I prayed last night and I said, Lord, if I have spoken the truth, let the truth find the hearts that are seeking and that want to know the truth. But a couple of funny people I was told on the call who were making uh, rude comments and, and funny comments, I pray for them. Pray that the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened, even as scriptures say. Amen. Praise God. I'm not sure what I want to do this morning. I know we're supposed to be uh, studying Micah. Uh, there's just four chapters left in it. <clears throat> We've got four, five, six, and seven. All right, I'm going to teach four and five, and then I'm going to take questions, All right? And then tomorrow is Thursday, I will teach six and seven, and then I'll teach whatever y'all want me to teach. So let us know on the telegram what you want to know, All right? And the most popular request will be what we'll talk about on Thursday. I want us to finish my card. I don't want us to take it into next week. So four and five today, Q and A. <clears throat> Six and seven tomorrow. And then the topic that you all have requested to learn something about. Somebody said part two of last night. <laughs> part two is practical. So if you have a wife or a husband, go practice. <laughs> if you're single, obey God. That's part two. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Father, we we are just swaying off of you. Of who you are. And who we are to you. What an awesome privilege to be called sons of Almighty God. Thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. And you showed it, you demonstrated it. As you laid down your lives for us. We are who we are today because of that supreme sacrifice, Jesus, and we do not take you for granted. We are truly grateful. Thank you that we get to spend eternity with you. What joy to look forward to that time when we shall no longer die. Thank you. As we break the bread of life this morning, speak to our hearts clearly. Speak to us as individuals because you know us as individuals. Then speak to us collectively because you have given us a mandate in this local expression of the body of Christ. Our hearts cry remain that we may know you and the fellowship of your suffering. We may know your resurrection power. And that we may, we may be made conformable to your death. So that we can understand the reason for which you arrested our lives. Use us to the praise and to the glory of your name we pray. In Jesus name. Amen. All right, this is I believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. We love the Lord. We study scriptures verse by verse. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 21-22. We believe no one buys a book and jumps about the chapters, sentences, paragraphs. 
You got to read it from the beginning to the end. That way you understand the book and understand the mind of the book. Right? We've been in the Old Testament uh, quite some time now, a year and a half. And uh, we'll be done with it, I reckon, by the first quarter of this year. There's no reason why we shouldn't be done by April. And then we can go into the New Testament uh, to learn more about the dispensation that God is operating under now, which is the dispensation of grace, and learn the truth about the covenant that we are enjoying right now. The Bible says it's a covenant that's better than the old one. If fault was not found with the old one, God would not have had reason to suspend it. And I thank him for grace. As we are who we are by the grace of God. For now, we're in Micah chapter 4, so let's jump right into it. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. The kingdom and many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and he will walk and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. For they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halted, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halted, I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. The Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why dost thou cry out loud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled. Let our eye look upon Zion, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Rise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. Thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole. Praise God. Again, let me remind you that scriptures are arranged the way they were arranged for whatever reasons Bible scholars had. When we read, things did not necessarily happen the way it's uh, put in scriptures. And we see a classic example here. Uh, Micah jumps from explaining the reproach of the people and, and all the uh, wrong things that they were doing. He jumps from that and he jumps clear into the future. Even our own distant, well, not so distant anymore, his distant future, but our future that's really close by because the Lord is close by. I know they've been saying this since the Bible was written. And I know even in the days of Paul, they kept saying the Lord is close by. And so when we say the Lord is close by, People, it just flies right over their heads. Let me give you some food for thought. 
that will help you to live circumspectly before God. The Bible is clear. It says no man knows the day nor the hour. Jesus said that. Only the Father does. But he also said something. He said, you guys are my friends. And I'm not going to hide from you what I intend to do. We see an example in scriptures. When God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he went to see Abraham. Okay. Those of you who really are not familiar with scriptures, uh, let me give you the references rather than just give you a synopsis. Um, Genesis. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This wasn't what I planned. As a matter of fact, I didn't plan anything. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so you can help me. I'm looking for the account of um, when, when God went to see Abraham. Thank you, Jesus. Just before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. The Bible is falling to pieces. I have to do something about it. Have you found it? Uh, Genesis 18. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Let's read Genesis 18. When Micah, don't, don't mind me this morning, but I, 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 I'm just going to follow what my spirit is telling me to do. And the Lord appeared unto him, that's Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So Abraham was sitting outside the tent door because it was hot inside the tent. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. All right. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd, and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and calf, and the calf when he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did it. And he said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will suddenly return unto thee according to the time of life, and though Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were stricken old in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She had stopped menstruating at this point. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord also being old? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of the shorty bear a child, which I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a, time, a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, but she was afraid. And she said, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Shall I hide from my friend that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Gentlemen, I hope you're hearing that. God says, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. And the Lord said, because, of the, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. The men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. 
And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? But adventure there be 50 righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. For adventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous, wilt thou destroy the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, For adventure there shall be forty found. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. For adventure there shall 30 be found. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. For adventure there shall be 20 found. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. For adventure 10 shall be found. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. A lot in that chapter, but I'm not going to go into it. My point is that you can bargain, if you like, with God. Or let me use it a, a better term. You can intercede with God. That's what Abraham was doing. He was interceding for the righteous people that may still be in Sodom and Gomorrah, in spite of everything that God said had come to his hearing. God said, for the sake of 10, I won. But of course, God knew there wasn't 10 righteous. Abraham was doing what he was doing because his nephew Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he wanted to be sure that the boy would at least escape. And since God assured him that if he found 10, he would spare the place, uh, his mind was at rest that suddenly his nephew, whom he had groomed from the time his father died, Abraham's older brother, uh, would surely still be in the way of, of truth and would be able to escape amongst the 10 that God said they would, uh, he would be amongst the 10 that God said for their sakes, they would not destroy the place. All right. Uh, I branched into that for you to know that God will let us know. He may not give us a date, June 5, August 10, January 15. He may not give us a date, but he lets us know by the signs of the times. If you read Matthew 24, Jesus said you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, stuff happening in nature that tells us. I mean, Houston in March is 41 degrees. That's not normal. And it's been like that. A couple of days ago, I think four days ago, we were at 81 degrees. Then it went to 60, then it dropped to 40, right? Crazy stuff is happening all over the place. And Jesus called them birth pains. It's like a woman that's about to bring to birth. She goes into labor. Sometimes labor can be as long as 12 hours, 15 hours. If she's able to handle it. Right? So we know that the Lord is coming soon because of all the stuff that's been happening. Let me give you scriptures. I'm not giving you dates. I don't have dates and I don't know dates. Nobody does. But the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you're familiar with it, if you're not, I encourage you to go and read it. The Bible reports that the Good Samaritan, uh, the, the, a, a man was traveling, and he fell amongst thieves. They beat him up, left him half dead, and they parted all his goods away. If you understand the principle of types and shadows, which I've taught before, how that God was not able to tell them stuff in the Old Testament because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They couldn't have spiritual understanding. We do because we have the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And so God would tell them to do something which was a shadow of the real thing. Kill an unblemished land and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. It's a type of the shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the perfect Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world. Okay? Incense in the Old Testament. It's a type and a shadow of prayer in the New Testament. If we apply the principle of the type of 
of type and shadows to the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jay, please look for it. It's got to be in one of the synoptic gospels. We put the reference up there. Um, we can say the guy who was traveling is a type of you and I, a type of humanity. He fell amongst thieves who beat him up and left him for dead. A type of the devil who messed humanity up, left us dead. The Bible reports that the Levite, who is of the priesthood order, came by, saw him, crossed the street, and went on his way. Then a priest came by, saw him, crossed the street, went on his way. The Levite and the priest are types of world religion that cannot help humanity in the fallen state that we are in. After that, the Good Samaritan comes along. The Bible says he's coming from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem being a type of heaven, Jericho being a type of the earth, the Good Samaritan being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who comes and finds this guy in the horrible state that he's in. The Bible records that he stops, he puts oil and wine on his injuries, the type of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God is uh, sometimes um, not referred to, but symbols that are used to represent the Holy Spirit. It could be um, oil, it could be wine, it could be a dove. So the good Samaritan who is a type of Jesus stops, puts oil and wine on his injuries, which is a type of the Holy Spirit, what he does for you when he comes into your life, he finds you in a mess that uh, sin and, and uh, the devil has put us in. He puts him on his donkey, a type of how he bears our burden. He takes him to an inn, the type of the church. He tells the innkeeper, the type of the pastor, Look after him for me. He pays two pennies, which is two days wages. Two pennies, two days wages. And he says to the innkeeper, type of the pastor, look after him. Whatever else extra that you spend, when I come back on my trip, I will reimburse you. The Bible says a day is like a thousand years before the Lord. Look for that scripture, put it up. And a thousand years is like a day before the Lord. If he paid for two days wages, applying principle of types and shadows, we can say he paid for 2,000 years. And then he says, if I stay longer, whatever extra that you spend, I will reimburse you when I come. We are in year 2022. 22 years above 2,000 years. And he has already said, if I carry beyond the two days wages that I gave you, when I come back, I will reimburse you. We are in that, if I tarry, when I come back, period. All right? Matthew 24, the disciples said to Jesus, tell us when the end of the world will come. And Jesus told them, you're going to hear stuff, you're going to see stuff. Nature itself, the Bible says nature is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Please look for that scripture. Nature is out of order because it's waiting for us to manifest. And the sons of God, rather, rather than manifesting the glory and the power and the dominion and the authority that we have, we're busy playing church. I still do not believe in my heart that the church could not have prayed and stopped Katrina or Harvey. I still don't believe we could not have done it. Elijah prayed and for three years there was no rain. Elijah, and he was an Old Testament saint. He prayed again and rain came. What are we doing? I'm tired of reading all this thing. I want to see it. 
Praise God. Back to what I was saying to you. Jesus answered them, Matthew 24. He said, you're going to see all kinds of things going on, but the end hasn't really come. We're in Micah. The end really hasn't come. All right, Matthew 24. I want to go there. A brief moment. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, from, uh, from about verse 4, Jesus answered, he said, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name saying, I'm Christ. And they will deceive many. And we see them on the internet. All right? You will hear wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. Everybody now is what's going on in Ukraine. And, and all kinds of people on YouTube telling you the interpretation of what's going on. They lie. That's just the truth. All right? The Bible doesn't tell us that there's going to be a third world war. It doesn't. The next major war that's going to be fought is between Jesus and the forces of darkness. That's what scripture tells us. It says you will hear wars, rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. Gasoline can become $10 for all I care. I will walk. We're lazy in this part of the world. Kids walk, walk to school in Africa. I used to work, work in, in one, one place in, in Nigeria. And I would cry almost every morning. Because the kids would walk two miles to school. How do you get to school after walking two miles and still be able to concentrate on what you're being taught? All right, <clears throat> Jesus said these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So whether Putin is fighting the whole world or not, Jesus said the end will not is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up to be afflicted. They will kill you. You'll be hated of nations for my name's sake. Right? Because iniquity shall abound, the love of men he shall wax cold. We're seeing it already. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And then he says in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Has the gospel been preached to all the world? Yes. Has the gospel been preached in all the nations? Yes. Satellites, CNN, TV has made that possible. The Bible didn't say every man would hear the gospel. I used to think everybody had to hear. It says... It will be preached in all the world, and it has been preached in all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and every nation has heard. Everybody may not have heard. The Bible says every nation. After the world and the nations have heard, the end will come. So the end is near. All right? But he gives us more clues. He says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which, him which is in the housetop not come down. And so on and so forth. This doesn't concern the church. This here that Jesus is talking about. All right. Is for the people who don't make the rapture. Jesus is going to show up in the skies. He's not going to touch the earth. We are going to be caught up with him. First Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that. The church is called the great parenthesis. Because we were inserted into God's agenda for his people, the Jews. If you were with us when we read the book of Daniel. The Bible says 70 weeks were determined for your people. 
and a week is equivalent to seven years. If you don't understand, don't worry about it. But catch the meat of what I'm sharing with us this morning before I go back to Micah. At the 69th week, God suspended his plan with the Jewish people and he introduced the church. He must, of a necessity, wrap up the church age, remove the church in what is commonly referred to as the rapture, and then start his last week of Daniel's prophecy, which is seven years. That last week of Daniel's prophecy is the seven years of the Antichrist's reign. Okay? Now, so Jesus tells us very clearly the stuff that we're seeing. We're seeing it because the end is near. Jump to verse 32. He said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily. The word verily is an old English word for most assuredly. I assure you. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man. No, not angels in heaven, but my father only. Jesus Christ is clear. He says the generation that witnesses the burden of the fig tree, that generation will not pass away. And the end will come. Israel, again, types and shadows, is sometimes referred to as the fig that budded. The fig tree budded May 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation again. They had been scattered abroad the earth because of their sins. God told them very clearly, I think in Exodus, that if you if you sin, if you don't Deuteronomy, sorry, if you sin and you you do all of these things, I will I will so render you useless. They will take you to the slave market. Nobody will buy you. All right. That's why you have Polish Jews, American Jews, British Jews, and German Jews. God scattered them scattered them abroad all the nations, and then He gathered them back together again on the 29th of November 1947. The United Nations uh, decided to give them a homeland again. And they carved out that little strip that's now present-day Israel. And on the 14th of May, 1948, they all went back home. And they're still returning home now. Jesus said the generation that witnesses it will not pass away before the end comes. The generation is 70 or 80 years. Psalm 90 tells us that. It says the days of a man are three score years and 10, 70 years. And if by reason of hard work, it could be four score years, 80 years. If the fig tree budded in 1948, add 80 years to it and tell me what you get. What? 2028. 20, I'm not telling you Jesus is coming back in 2028. Don't run off and say, Pastor Mo said. No one knows the day nor the hour. We don't know. But there are signs all around us that he's coming is soon. Micah. In the last days it shall come to pass. I told you he jumped to his own distant future, our own not so distant future. That's why I went into the trouble of going to Genesis and Matthew and all of that for you to see. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. Mountains refer to nations. And the mountain of the Lord is Israel because Jesus Christ is coming back 
and is going to rule the world out of Jerusalem. So he's saying Israel would take its rightful place as God's chosen nation. And we don't know why he chose uh, Israel. He just did. He could very well have chosen Rwanda or Ethiopia or uh, uh, what other nations are there, or even Russia, but he chose Israel. We don't know why. He says that mountain of the Lord will rule over all of the other mountains, all of the other nations. All right. It shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. Many nations shall say, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion. All right. That's Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So his coming is imminent. Thank God we are saved. And when the rapture happens, we will leave. He has told us that we are not appointed to wrath. There is no man. Ask all the gentlemen on this call. There is no man that is worth his salt as a man. That will leave his wife to suffer. We are his bride. He will not leave us behind. When the Antichrist starts his craziness. All right. Many nations shall come and say. Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the Lord shall go forth of Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people. He will rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, because there will no longer be war. The prince of peace himself will be ruling the world. All right? That's why they will convert all their instruments of war into instruments of peace. A uh, nation shall not lift up his sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. For they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. There will be kingdom security, there will be kingdom prosperity. We will all be known even as we are known, because we will be with him, we will see him face to face. We will be in our glorified bodies, and our glorified bodies are not restricted by time. They're not restricted by, by space. Jesus showed up in the middle of the room that was locked up. After his crucifixion, death, burial, the disciples were afraid because they didn't know what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were going to do to them now that their leader was dead. So they were locked up in a room and Jesus showed up in the midst of them. So the, the locked door didn't disturb him. The walls didn't hold him back. You might be in Israel and not be in this part of the world still. And just the thought of, I'm going to see Deidre. I show up in Israel because there's no distance and there's nothing that holds back the glorified body, the resurrected body. Okay? They will sit every man under the vine tree in peace, everybody minding their own business. Verse 5 says, all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That would imply, I'm not sure, but it would imply that some people still won't want to serve the true and living God. But whatever the case is, we know whom we have believed. And we know to whom we belong. Apostle Paul says, I know whose I am and whom I serve. All right? Then it says, in that day, said the Lord, will I assemble her that halted, and I will gather her that is driven out, and have, and her that I have afflicted. Again, he backtracked a little, and he's talking about how God is going to restore Israel, which has already happened May 14th, 1948. That's a historical fact. So he's talking about it, how Israel is going to be gathered back into Zion. All right. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Then he jumps back in time again. 
and it talks about the captivity of Israel in Babylon. All right. Now, why does thou proud allow Zenu king in thee, and so on and so forth? We know very clearly from verse 10, middle of verse 10, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So it goes back in time to the time that Israel was in apostasy. Uh, Judah joined her. And then the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity happened under Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Then he goes on in verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee, that say, let her be defiled, let her eye look upon Zion. They know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn as iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. Thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. He jumps back in time again. All right. Talking about the battle of Armageddon. How the Lord is going to fight against all of the nations that come against Israel. They think because she's tiny. They can do what they like with her. <laughs> One who defends her. His name is Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord, the man of war. His name is Jehovah El Gibo, the mighty one. Go and read about the Six Day War and explain to me how a country as tiny as Israel took on the whole Arab world and defeated them in six days. Sadly, they were ignorant. They didn't know that was the period the atonement, the feast of atonement in Israel. They came at Israel at a time that God had forgiven all iniquity. And his holy self was at liberty to defend them. Because all sins were cancelled. Sometimes when God is orchestrating stuff in your life, be still. Just be still. I don't care what it looks like. It's never it. It's never what it looks like. He's working things after the counsel of his will. That's what the Bible says. And then he tells you, all things will work together for your good. All things. No matter what it looks like. Just be still. He said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. How will he leave you without hope? How will he leave you without help? What parent does that? Even an insane mother. Go and try and take her child from her. And you'll know that her sanity ends where her child is concerned. God loves you. God will move heaven and earth for any child of his. Any questions in chapter 4? Right, if you have no questions, chapter five. Now gather thyself, O troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. 
Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They shall abide for now, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waited for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses, out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. And I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. And thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Then in this chapter of scripture, Micah the prophet is jumping about in different time frames. All right. <clears throat> um, from verses 1 to 3, he jumps into the future, his future but it's our past, all right? He says, gather yourself, O troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And you know what happened to him? How he was seized, how he was falsely accused, how they stood him all night before the Sanhedrin, questioning him. And the Bible says he opened not his mouth. He did not say one word. He was exhausted. A couple of hours before then, he had been in the garden of Gethsemane praying. Stressed to the point where capillaries under his skin began to pop. And he began to sweat blood. He had just gone through that. And they seized him. And they took him to this false trial. And he was standing all night. And then they took him to Pilate to be further tried. But Pilate's wife warned him and said, don't get involved in this mess with these Jewish people. This man hasn't done anything wrong. Pilate washes his hands clean off of it. And he says, do what you guys like. It was the custom at that time to release one prisoner. One prisoner. All right. And Pilate asked them, he said, who do you want? They shouted, release Barabbas, the robber, the armed robber. Crucify this one. And then they made him carry the cross. They made him walk down that Via de la Rosa. And he got to the point where he just fell and he couldn't go on anymore. Got a hold of Simon the Cyrenian to carry the cross for him to Golgotha, where he was crucified. Right? He went through all of that for us. He says in verse 2, that this is how we know that he's talking about Jesus. He says, but thou, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, even though you are the least among the thousands of cities in Judah, yet out of you shall come forth unto me he that is to be the ruler in Israel. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. All right? Now, listen to this. Caesar, who was ruling Israel for Rome at that time, passed an edict and said, there's going to be a census. And so everybody 
go back to your hometown. <clears throat> what kind of sense does that make? Let's stop for a minute and think about it. I'm looking for the scripture because everything I'm sharing with you is from my heart this morning. I'm just pouring my heart out to you. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody help me. <clears throat> if it's not in Matthew, but I think it should be there, it will be in one of the synoptic gospels. It's definitely not John. So it's either Mark or Luke. Thank you, Spirit of God. I want us to read it. Hallelujah. Have you found it? Mm. What did you say the verse said? I think it's in Luke. I thought it was Matthew, but it's not there. It's not in Mark. It's probably in Luke. When the uh, um, when uh, Herod told them all to go back to their home countries to be counted for the census. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's Luke Amen. chapter two. Luke chapter two. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Caesar did not know he was fulfilling scriptures when he made that decree. Why couldn't people be taxed in their state of residence? Why did they have to go back? their birth states because the word of God will not be broken. Micah had prophesied that out of Bethlehem the ruler of Israel will come forth. And somebody says the Bible is just a book. Micah lived Micah lived let me see Um, during the reign of Hezekiah, we were the first kings. I want to see if I can find out. I don't know if the Bible mentions when he uh, was born, but we know that he was a prophet for about 40 years. If I can't find it, let me not waste time on it. But the truth of the matter is, Micah had said in chapter 5 that out of Ephrata, the ruler of Israel was going to come forth. But Joseph and Mary and the baby were living in Nazareth. And, and the pregnant Mary were living in Nazareth. So it was necessary for them to go back to Bethlehem. And I'm sure Joseph would ha have had no reason to go back to Bethlehem. But the king made a decree which made him go back to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem. And someone thinks the Bible is just a book. Think about it. What sense does it make? Think about the shifting of economies. For everybody to travel. That's why when they got to the inn in Bethlehem, it was full. Because everybody had gone back home. For this silly edict that Caesar made. And thank God for that innkeeper. Who was kind enough to let them use his table. Well he himself was fulfilling prophecy. Because it had been prophesied that he would be born in a lowly stable. And the Bible is just an ordinary book so Micah from verses 1 to 3 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ his future our past All right then in verse 4 
he jumps again to a different time frame. He's talking about uh, he will stand on feet in, in the strength of the Lord, still talking about Jesus, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. So he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 5, he jumps back to the Assyrian invasion of the children of Israel. And we've read that in the book of Daniel. All right. He talks about how that they will be scattered, the children of Israel in verse 7. Talks about the, the remnant uh, of, of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as the dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that does not uh, wait for man or wait for the sons of man. All right. The remnant of Jacob shall be amongst the Gentiles. They were scattered amongst the Gentiles. In the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts and so on and so forth. And then he talks about how God will now turn around and gather them together again. Verse 10, and it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. I will destroy thy chariots. There will be no more war. I will cut off the cities of the land and throw down all the strongholds. There will be no more idolatry. I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand. Uh, no more soothsayers. No more graven images. No more standing images. They will no longer worship the work of their hands, obviously, because Jesus will be in the midst of them at that time. All right. I will pluck up all the groves out of the midst of thee. I will destroy all of these cities. I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have never heard or experienced. You have an understanding now. Are you clear? All right. I'll take questions. And tomorrow we'll do six and seven. And we'll, we'll also uh, touch on whatever it is that you all put in the Telegram chat that you want to learn about. Uh, let me remind the 24 people that are in the new uh, discipleship class, new believers discipleship class. Um, I gave you an assignment on Monday. Be sure to do it. All right, I'm not going to teach in depth. I'm just going to touch on it. And then I'll take questions from you. Um, if you don't understand what you've watched, it doesn't make any sense for me to teach it all over again. If the resource is available, take the time to find out how to pray so that you can learn how to pray effectively. Questions about these two chapters, about anything that you want to know. Okay, if we don't have any questions, let's call it a day. Father, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light. Thank you for your wisdom that's made available to us. The Bible says Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom. Thank you, Lord God, as you continue to teach us and expound scriptures. You continue to give us understanding and insight. Lord, it's our heart's desire to live for you, to serve you. Let it be said of us that these ones have been with Jesus. Let your light so shine out of us. That men will see our good works and give glory to you, our Father. Pray for everyone that's in this fellowship, my Father. That you will continue to write your laws upon the tablets of their hearts. And as the word of God says... That they will come to a time where no man will have to say to them, no God, because they will know you by themselves. Thank you, spirit of truth, spirit of grace. Continue your ministry in our lives. Everything that the Lord has assigned for you to do in us, we give you the right of way to do it in our lives. We give you thanks and praise in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray with thanksgiving. God bless you. Thank you for coming. I will see you tomorrow.